Well, what a joy it is uh, to be back at Resolved. This has been on my calendar for 365 days, and there's a sense in which it overshadows the whole year just anticipating gathering this many hot hearts together in one room. And there's a sense in which 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 10, equals 20, because we stimulate one another and fire up one another. I'm reminded of what John Wesley once said. He said, "'Give me 100 men, I care not whether they be preachers or laymen, who fear nothing but God and hate nothing but sin, and I will turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ.'" Well, I know we've got at least 100 people in this room. In fact, we have over 2,000 people in this room, and I would assume that so many of you desire the Lord and you want your life to count for eternity, and that's why you're here to be built up in your faith and to be encouraged and strengthened in the things of the Lord. And so my prayer is that God will maximize this opportunity and that we will throw ourselves into this hour with holy boldness. Now, I must tell you, as I come to this pulpit tonight, that my desire is for those of you in this room who have not yet come all the way to Christ, who are here because there is something that is drawing you, and that is certainly the Lord, no doubt to find out more about the things of Christ. But you've not yet come all the way to Christ, and you've not yet surrendered your life to Christ. And there's no such thing as a half commitment to Christ. It's all or nothing. And there's no easy believism in the kingdom of heaven, and there's no cheap grace. And so my message tonight is really directed to those of you who are in this auditorium tonight who have not yet exercised saving faith in Jesus Christ. You've not yet come all the way, and God knows who you are. Some of you here tonight perhaps do not even realize that you're not saved. Maybe you've grown up in the church, maybe you've grown up around other Christians, maybe you have grown up going to Bible studies or Christian concerts, and you've been inoculated with just enough of Christianity that you know the vocabulary and you know how to hang out with the other Christians, but you don't yet have the real thing. And so my desire tonight is to bring a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would be called by the Lord into His kingdom tonight, and that this place would be a delivery ward, and that there would be men and women, boys and girls, who would come to faith in Jesus Christ. What I want to preach on tonight is the most shocking thing that Jesus ever said. The most shocking thing that Jesus ever said. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, because Jesus said a lot of shocking things. But this takes the cake. This goes over the edge. This is the single most riveting thing that I believe Jesus Christ ever said that ought to arrest our attention and get a hold of us. In Matthew chapter 7, I want to begin reading in verse 13. This comes at the end of the most provocative sermon that Jesus ever preached. It comes at the end of the greatest sermon that our Lord ever proclaimed. It's the first recorded sermon that we have. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it builds and it builds and it builds. And our Lord was the greatest evangelist who ever lived. And as he comes to the end of this sermon, beginning in verse 13, he issues the greatest invitation that has ever been extended to lost sinners to come to himself, to surrender their lives to him. And it is an invitation that is going out in this, this hall tonight. It is the invitation of Jesus Christ through his word to your heart. And may God the Holy Spirit call you Himself into a saving relationship with Christ. Beginning in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 13, Jesus said these words, "'Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter through it. 
For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The Lord Jesus Christ said many shocking things in His earthly ministry, and these have come to be known as the hard sayings of Christ. And quite frankly, they are the hard sayings of Christ, not because they are hard to understand. They are hard because they're hard to swallow. They're hard to accept. And perhaps the most shocking statement statement to ever come out of the mouth of our Lord are the very words that we find in this text here tonight, because in these verses, Jesus said in no uncertain terms that there are actually more people going to hell and then there are to heaven. Many, Jesus said, are on the broad road that are headed to destruction. Few, Jesus said, are on the narrow road headed to life. There's no other spin to put on those words. But what makes this even more jolting is that Jesus Christ is talking about religious people in these verses. He's talking about people who claim to know God. He's talking about people who say, Lord, Lord, He's talking about people who on the last day will say, Lord, you knew me. I cast out demons in your name. Lord, I perform many miracles in your name. Lord, you know me. And it is about this highly religious group that Jesus said, many are on the broad road of destruction and most are headed to eternal hell. I tell you, this is the most shocking thing that Jesus ever said. And quite frankly, the entire Sermon on the Mount was shocking. From the very opening lines of this sermon, everything was turned upside down from what they were used to hearing. Jesus began this sermon with the Beatitudes, and He said, "'Blessed are the poor in spirit.'" What they were used to hearing was, "'Blessed are those who have all that this world has to offer, who are rich in the things of this world.'" And Jesus said, "'No, you've got it all backwards.'" Blessed are those who have declared spiritual bankruptcy on the inside and who are poor in spirit. And Jesus said, blessed are they who, those who mourn. And the world says, blessed are, are those who are gregarious and, and, and glib and funny and, and all of the rest. And Jesus said, oh no, those who are truly happy are those who have come to mourn and to weep over their sin. And Jesus said, blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle. And the world says the very opposite. The world says, get all you can and can all you get, sit on the lid and let everyone else go to hell. And Jesus said, no, blessed are the meek and blessed are the gentle. He said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He even went so far as to say, blessed are those who have been persecuted. How shocking was this? And then he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And no one could surpass the outward morality and the outward righteousness of the Pharisees. They had perfected to an art form the game of playing church. No one could out-church the Pharisees. And then Jesus set the bar so high on what it would take in and of yourselves to be saved, 
that no one could ever get over this bar when Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And with that, he pulled the rug out from underneath his audience and turned them on their ear that they would have to be as perfect as God is in heaven because that is the very standard by which God is measuring every one of our lives. It's just as if there are these scales or balances, and on one side of the balances, there is your life placed, and on the other side is not some drunk in a, in a gutter or not some wayward vagabond that it would be very easy to measure your life against someone like that and go, well, I'm better than them. God will grade on the curve. I'll be good enough to be accepted into heaven. The fact is God places your life on one side of the scales, and on the other side of the scales, He places the absolute perfect holiness of His own righteous character. And we have all been weighed in the balances and found wanting on that measure. And so Jesus brought His listeners that day to a sense of desperation that they had to be more righteous than the scribes or the Pharisees. They had to be as perfect as God is in heaven. And then He comes to the end of this message and He gives what is the most glorious gospel invitation. It is the invitation to come into the kingdom of heaven. It is the invitation to come to Himself. It is the invitation to come to the end of yourself that He might begin in your life. It is the invitation to come to His grace and forgiveness and to be embraced into His kingdom. It is the greatest invitation that's ever been given. And I want to ask you as we begin to look at... I want to look at verses 13 and 14 tonight, but I want to ask you this. This invitation is going out to everyone in this auditorium tonight. And I want to know, have you personally and have you individually, by repentance and faith, responded to this invitation and given your life to Jesus Christ? If I had 10,000 lives, I'd give every one of them to Jesus Christ. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to give your life to Christ. The greatest thing you will ever do is to give your life to Christ and watch what He does with it and watch what He makes of it, both in time and eternity. Well, tonight I want us to look at verse 13 and 14. As we look at these verses, there are three things that I want you to see, three very simple headings. I want you to see the command enter through the narrow gate. Then I want you to note with me the caution because there's another gate right next to the narrow gate that has a lot of curb appeal and is very accessible and it would be very easy to be sucked in through this other gate. It is the wide gate or the broad gate and so the caution and then finally the contrast as Jesus Himself in verse 14 will explain more carefully uh, this narrow gate that He calls us to enter through. Note with me, if you would, beginning in verse 13, the command, uh, the command. Jesus begins this gospel invitation by saying, enter through the narrow gate. This is what He says to you tonight, to enter through the narrow gate. Would you notice that there is only this one sole requirement to enter into the kingdom of heaven? There are not five things that you have to do tonight. There aren't ten things that you have to do. There is only one thing that you have to do to become a member of the kingdom of God, and it is to enter through the narrow gate. This also presupposes that you were born on the outside. The fact that you must enter means that you came into this world on the outside of the kingdom. We were all born physically in sin, Psalm 51, verse 5, in sin did my mother conceive me. We were all born in a, in a state of sin. Uh, Psalm 58, verse 3 says that we came forth from our mother's womb speaking lies. From the very outset of our life at the point of conception and it extended through our delivery and now is 
We have lived our lives. We came into this world an alien of the kingdom of God. And we entered as a stranger on the outside. And so that's why Jesus said, you must enter through the narrow gate. Being born in a Christian family is not good enough. Attending church is not good enough. Being religious is not good enough. There must be a step of faith by which you enter through the narrow gate. I want you to know that Jesus Christ Himself is this narrow gate. In John 10, verse 7, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. In John 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And I want you to know that there are no other points of entry into the kingdom. Would you notice the definite article, the? Enter through the narrow gate, not a narrow gate, not one of many ways to get into the kingdom. It's not as if Heaven is up there, and there are many roads that spiral up this mountain, and there are different ways for us to come into the kingdom. No, Jesus said there is only one way. There is only one way of entry into His kingdom, and He is that way of entry. Enter through the narrow gate. The apostle Peter said there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The apostle Paul said, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. The fact that this is a narrow gate requires repentance. It requires leaving your baggage behind. It requires leaving behind the love of sin and the love of the world and love of self. Jesus said, if any man shall come after me, he must deny himself and take up a cross and follow after me. There is no way to come through this narrow gate except you strip down and strip away all self-sufficiency and all self-righteousness, and you humble yourself and you come as a little child into the kingdom of heaven, and it is a narrow gate whereby you can only come one at a time. You can't come in a group. You're going to have to peel off from the group. You're going to have to break from the pack. You're going to have to break even from your family and come one at a time to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I also want you to note that this is a command. He says, enter through the narrow gate. It is a present imperative, which means that He is commanding, He is calling everyone under the sound of His invitation to leave what they, where they are and to leave what they are and to come immediately to Him and to enter through the narrow gate. You need to know that the gospel is a command. And you will either live in obedience or disobedience to this Christ who is calling you to enter through the narrow gate. And to fail to respond to this gospel is to commit the greatest sin under heaven. It is to trample underfoot the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to insult the Spirit of grace who would be convicting to say no to the gospel of Christ is to commit the greatest sin under heaven. It requires that you take a step of faith, that final step of faith. It's not enough to come close to Christ. It's not enough to admire the gate. It's not enough to see others go through that gate. It's not enough to believe in the existence of the gate. It's not enough to marvel at the gate as an act of your will. You must surrender and you must choose to take that last step by which you leave the world and leave the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of light and into His beloved Son. That's what God is calling you tonight to do. And for those of you here who are on the outside... We're so glad that you're here to hear this gospel invitation. And He is calling out through this gospel to you. 
to respond by faith and to come and enter through the narrow gate. Later, Jesus would say in Luke 13, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. Agonizomai, you must agonize to enter through this narrow gate. It will require soul searching. It will require deep conviction. It will require you counting the cost. It will require you renouncing the world. It will require you denying yourself. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. They will come too shallow. They will come too superficial. They will come in a way in which they are not striving to enter through the narrow gate. Let there be no mistake about it, tonight Jesus is issuing His invitation through His Word as it's being preached. And the voice of God is going out through His Word. Even this moment tonight, do you hear the voice of Christ who is calling you? Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28, "'Come unto Me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light." Sometimes people say it's hard to become a Christian. I want you to know the greatest thing that will ever happen to your life is to become a Christian. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. No, what's hard is for you to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church and try to play all ends into the middle. That's what's hard. And for you to continue to sow the seeds of sin and to reap that bitter harvest, that is what is hard. My friend, it is glorious. It is wonderful. It is amazing to finally come to that place whereby you surrender and commit your life to Jesus Christ and say an everlasting yes to Him. And Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto Me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Have you heard the call of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ to your heart? Have you answered that call? Perhaps even as I'm speaking right now, some of you are feeling a little anxious on the inside and feeling somewhat uneasy, and it is because you are halting between two opinions, and you will always feel that struggle, and you will have no rest for your soul until you find your rest in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to notice second, if you would with me, not only the command... And this is God's command to everyone in this house tonight, and you will either obey or disobey, and there are no other options. I want you to notice second, the caution. The caution, and Jesus belabors this point in, in verse 13, the great caution. There must be great caution exercised to enter through the narrow gate because there is another gate right next to it which is much easier to access. It's much easier to enter through. It too is open. And what caution you must exercise that you not enter through the wrong gate because it will take you somewhere you do not want to go. Look at it again in verse 13. After Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. Now here is the caution. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many are those who enter through it. It's like when you go to an airport and there can be two gates right next to each other. And as you go to the airport, these two gates... One may say, New York City, and the other may say, Tokyo, and yet they are right next to each other, and yet they will take you in two totally opposite directions, 
And so it is with these two gates. They will take you in two totally opposite directions. One will take you to heaven, the other will take you to hell. One will take you to forgiveness and grace, the other will take you to condemnation and damnation. How careful you must be to enter through the right gate. And so Jesus begins to describe now in verse 13 this other gate that takes you down another path that ends up at a, at a different destination, and He does so intentionally and purposely so that we would be certain that we would not by mistake to the deception of our own soul enter through the wrong gate. I would remind you that Jesus is addressing this to the most religious generation that has ever lived on the face of the earth. Jesus addressed this to Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, as well as the rest of the multitude that gathered there that day. I want you to notice with me first the, the wide gate. He begins verse, or the, this part of verse 13. He says, for the gate is wide. Because it's wide, it's very easy to find. It's very easy to see. It's so big, it's so large, it's so, it's so inviting, it's alluring, it, it's easily accessible, it's so large, it's like putting a golf ball into a hole that's the size of the Pacific Ocean. You can't miss when you get near this gate. It, it's easy to pass through. And what this gate is, is religion without regeneration. It is religion without the new birth. It is religion that appeals to the flesh. It is religion that talks about God and talks about Christ and talks about heaven and talks about salvation. The only problem is it is a gate that does not deliver. It does not take you there. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. It is the gate of easy believism that you come just as you are and you remain just as you are and there is nothing for you to give up and there is nothing for you to renounce and there is nothing for you to confess. It is religion without repentance. It is religion without submission to the Lordship of Christ. It is religion where you can continue to run your own life and run and chart the course for your own soul. It is religion without death to self. It is religion without cross-bearing. It is religion without denying self. It's religion that costs nothing and requires nothing. You just walk an aisle, raise a hand, sign a card, you're in. You're going to heaven. No, you're not. You're going to hell. It's religion of half a commitment. And these are those who are self-deceived. There is a veil over their own eyes. They think they have entered into the way of salvation only one day to wake up in the flames of hell. We see them in verse 21, these who are entering through this wide gate. In verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're talking the talk. And they're saying, Lord, Lord. They know the words to the songs. And they attend the Bible studies. They know the lingo. They know the jargon. They just don't know the Lord. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, referring to that last final day, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and they'll talk about how involved they were in, in religious activity. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Listen, they didn't do any of these things. They just thought they were. They were so self-deceived, they had convinced themselves that they were prophesying in the name of the Lord. And they were saying, I'm hearing voices. I'm, God's talking to me. This is what God's saying. No, He's not talking to you. Uh, we're casting out demons. We're performing miracles. 
you have convinced yourself of that which is not reality. You are self-deceived about your salvation, and you are self-deceived about your ministry. You are self-deceived about your religious activity. Your whole life is a facade. Oh, for a moment, just to pull back the veil and to see yourself for who you truly are, to see yourself for, for how God sees you. Notice where the wide gate takes you. It's religion on your own terms. It's churchianity. It's playing the game of, of church, and you, you're very good at it. It takes you down a broad way. Do you see that in verse 13? For the gate is wide and the way is broad. The domino effect now begins to unfold, and the broad gate, the wide gate will always and only lead you to the broad way. It's broad because there's no definition to it. It's like playing a football game and there's no sidelines. Hey, you're never out of bounds. You can live however you want to live. You can have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and you're, you're just always at home wherever you are. It's so broad that you can be a friend of the world and a so-called friend of the church at the same time. It's so broad, you can live however you want to live. You know, there are churches in this city and in this area you tell me whatever you want to believe and however you want to live, as bizarre, as, as way out there as it is, whatever kind of sin you want to commit, and we can find a church for you where you will feel very comfortable with the brethren. It's a broad road, religious but lost. It's religion without a changed life. It's religion without the fruit of repentance. And notice where it takes you. You continue to go down this broad road like a lamb led to slaughter, thinking that you are headed to the promised land, thinking that you are entering into the portals of glory. And notice it says that leads to destruction. Destruction here refers to damnation. It points to the final judgment in the last day and the sentence that will be executed or exercised and then you will be sentenced to hell forever. He says in verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. And when he says, I never knew you, he means I never had a relationship with you. I never personally knew you. God knows everything about everyone. He's not talking about cognitive facts about people. The very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows every word that you're going to say before you ever say it. All your days have been written in His book before there was one of them. He knows you better than you even know yourself because your heart is so deceptive. No, He knows everything there is to know about you, but He says to those who enter through the broad gate, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You were just out there on your own, doing your own thing, talking about me, but you never had the reality. He says it leads to destruction. In the end, you come to stand before a God whom you never knew. And the books are open and the book of life is open and you discover that your name was never written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world as you just continued to live this charade all the way to the end. And here's what's so shocking about it at the end of verse 13. It's the wide gate that leads to the broad way that leads to eternal destruction. And he says at the end of verse 13, and many are those who enter through it. The reason they enter through it is because their own hearts are so self-deceived. 
And one reason is because of verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They preach a false gospel to you. They preach to you that you can believe whatever you want to believe and live however you want to live. And they flag you onto this broad way and they seduce you and entice you and tempt you and and lure you because they tickle your ears and they say to you what you want to have said and they stroke your ego and they tell you you can have it all. You don't have to give up the world. You don't have to give up your sin. Just come through the wide gate. And wave after wave after wave of them are sucked onto this path of destruction that empties into the bowels of hell where these will be forever. In a gathering of this many people in one... We couldn't gather this many preachers together and everyone be saved. There's no way that there are not those among us here tonight that God has brought you here with divine intention, really out of the goodness of God, to remove the mask and to expose your heart to yourself that you are on this broad road that is headed for destruction. And if God is speaking to your heart tonight, you need to enter through the narrow gate Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. I want you to notice finally the contrast in verse 14, the contrast to what we just considered this religion that does not save, uh, this churchianity that does not deliver and does not take you to heaven. Notice in verse 14, Jesus now talks about the real deal. Jesus now talks about real salvation and genuine conversion and authentic regeneration. This is what you must have for your life and experience in your heart And if this is not a reality, it doesn't matter what else is right in your life. If your soul is lost, then everything is lost. So we read in verse 14 the same order, but it now presents what Jesus has come to do, who came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. He came not to bring condemnation, but to bring salvation to lost sinners. Notice he begins in verse 14, for the gate is small. This is true salvation. These are Jesus' words. The gate is small. That means it's narrow, it's tight, it's constricted. So therefore, it's hard to find. You'll not hear this gate preached on every street corner. You'll not hear this gate preached on every radio station. You'll not hear this gate described in every book that you pick up at the Christian bookstore. You'll not hear this gate on every Christian radio or television program. The gate is small. It's hard to find. Therefore, you'll have to search for it with all of your heart. And then once you find it, and once you hear the truth and how precious the truth is of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is so small that you will have to take great care to enter through it. For there will be many who will find it, and their toes will come right up to this gate but they will want to hang on to the baggage of their life. They will want to hang on to the patterns of their sin. They want to have it all, and they will not give it up, and so they are unable to come through this small gate. Because it's small, it requires breaking from the pack and breaking from the crowd that you would come individually to Christ. 
Turn with me to Matthew 9 and verse 9. I want to show you a couple who have come through this narrow gate and some more things that Jesus had to say about entering through this small gate. And I want to tell you tonight, I do not want to widen this gate any broader than what Jesus has said that it is. It's a small gate. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, as Jesus went out from there, He saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And there He was with the love of the world in His heart. There He was with the possessions of the world in His hand. And there is nothing wrong with having possessions, but there's everything wrong for possessions to have you. And here was Matthew sitting in his tax collector's booth, living for the world, a friend of the world, consumed with the world. You know what Matthew's life was? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. He was head deep into the system of the world. And Jesus said to him in verse 9, And this is the most repeated gospel invitation that we find in the four gospel records. Oh, the simplicity of this, follow me. In order to follow Christ, He must leave everything else behind, not follow a church, not follow a man a mere man, not follow a set of rules or regulations, not follow a code of ethics. No, follow me. Commit your life to me. Surrender to me. Give it all up for me. Get up from where you are. Move out by faith. Give me your life. Attach yourself to me. Become one of my followers. I'm not telling you where this will take you in this world. Just follow me every moment of every day. This is what it is to be one who enters through the narrow gate. There's no small print in this. You just get up every morning, put both feet on the floor, and your one goal in life is to follow me, to please me, to obey me, to love me, to serve me. I am the totality of your life. That's why Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you're living for anything else other than Christ and Christ alone, for you to die will be loss. But only if you live for sola Christos, Christ alone, will be for you to die is gain. Come to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. As Jesus is sending His disciples out to go and to proclaim the message of the kingdom, and in verse, beginning in verse 32, Jesus begins to bring explanation of what is required in this message that His disciples will announce, and it comes down to us today, and there is no watering down this this message. The one who responds to this is the one who has entered through the narrow gate. Everyone else is just pretenders. Look at verse 32, "'Therefore everyone who confesses Me before men... I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven." When he says, confess me before men, he's not saying just merely say the words. Remember he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Just to fill the air with the words of Christ, that won't save you. But within your heart of hearts, for you to so confess that you believe with every inch and every ounce of you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, I confess Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life, and He is my Savior. And Jesus said, that is the one whom I will confess before my Father. Let me tell you, you won't get into heaven without Him confessing you to the Father. In verse 33, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. 
I do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. What Jesus is calling for here is unrivaled, absolute loyalty and allegiance to Him, that's what it is to enter through the narrow gate. Not just that I'm adding Jesus to my life, but now Jesus is everything to me. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You can have no other rival loves in your heart and enter through this narrow gate. To enter through this narrow gate, you must come to the place where you love Christ and you desire Christ, and you set your heart and your love and your affections upon Him. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me, meaning there, there is no neutrality in this. You are either out and out for Christ or you are out and out against Christ. To enter through the narrow gate means that you come to pledge your allegiance to Christ. You are out and out for Him. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus said this, He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, and that means if anyone desires to be a Christian, if anyone desires to be my disciple, if anyone desires to enter through the narrow gate, he must deny himself. You must come to the end of yourself. You must renounce yourself for who you are and what you are in order that you may gain everything in Christ and take up His cross, that's an instrument of death. Jesus will not begin, the life of Christ will not begin in you until there is the death of you. There will not be two lives being lived in your life. It is either you live for yourself or you live for Christ. Jesus said, verse 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's pretty simple, is it not? You try to hang on to your own life and you'll lose it eternally. But if you will give your life to Christ completely, supremely, you will find eternal life. Verse 26, for what does it profit a man if he gains the, the whole world? He's speaking hypothetically here. And how we sell our soul out for such Cheap trinkets. He said, if you could gather it all, if you could have the whole world, if you could have all the gold and all the silver, if you could have all the real estate and all the property and all the stocks and all the bonds, what would it profit you if you lost your own soul? It would be the ultimate buy high, sell low proposition. Or what will a man give in exchange? for his soul. Now, if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must come to the end of yourself that Christ would begin and totally surrender your life to Him. And as long as you have one foot in the world and one foot in the fast lane and one foot trying to live for this world and for yourself, you have not yet come to put two feet upon Jesus Christ. Notice where this will take you. Come back to Matthew 7. To go through this narrow gate is to repent of your sin. Have you done that? Have you turned away from the world and its lures and affections? And have you turned completely to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ? This is what it is to enter through the small gate. I want you to know it is so hard to enter through this small gate that the only way you can do it is by sovereign grace. 
is for the grace of Almighty God to lay hold of your heart and to give you the gift of repentance and to give you the gift of true saving faith. That's how hard it is. It would be easier for you to go through the eye of a needle for your flesh to believe upon Christ than for you to enter through this small gate. It is a work of supernatural proportions. The new birth is the greatest miracle that God ever performs where God takes out that old stony heart that is so hardened to God and so hardened to the things of God, and for God Himself to reach down into the cavity of your chest with invisible hands and to pull out that stony heart and to put within you a heart of flesh that is alive unto God, and its first act is to call upon the name of the Lord and to be gloriously saved. That's how hard it is to enter through this narrow gate. God must do a work in your heart for it to be a reality. Notice where it leads. Verse 14, for the gate is small and the way is narrow. A small gate leads to a narrow way. You see, the small gate does not lead to the broad path. If you're on the broad path tonight, it is certain you've never come through the narrow gate. The broad gate leads down a broad path. A narrow gate leads down a narrow path. This narrow path is... It's carefully defined how you should live. To live on this narrow path is a new life direction for you. It is a new path. It is a new life. It is a changed life. It is the abundant life in Jesus Christ. It leads to the pursuit of holiness. It leads to the pursuit of righteousness. It doesn't mean that we don't ever sin the rest of our life. We know better than that. It doesn't mean the perfection of your life, but it does speak to the direction of your life. There is now a new path and a new direction that you're on. And when you do sin, you can no longer enjoy your sin. And there is a sense of shame and guilt that comes until you can repent of that sin and confess your sin and continue down this narrow path that leads He says in verse 14, to life, the first path leads to destruction. It leads to damnation. This path leads to life. It may seem restrictive. It may seem uh, that it is holding you back, but all that it will hold you back from is that which would harm you, that which would do destruction to you. How good of God to make it a narrow path that you would be in the very center of the goodness of His will for you, to lead you into green pastures and to lead you beside still waters. Praise God, it is a narrow path that keeps you away from the pollution of the world system, and it alone leads to life, to life. In other words, if you're not on this path, you don't have life. You're just a walking zombie. You are empty on the inside. There is no reality within you regarding the things of the Spirit of God. You have mere existence in this world, a form of godliness, but you do not have life. What is the new birth? It is the life of God and the soul of a man. That's what the new birth is. It is eternal life spiritual life, supernatural life. It is abundant life within you. How good it is to live finally in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the the life. The Bible says, he who has the Son has the life. There is no other life. It is the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. You're just occupying space and breathing God's air on this planet, but you're just a spiritual zombie. You are dead. But to enter through this narrow gate is for the life of God to fill you and to flood you. It's more than just paperwork in heaven where your sins are pardoned. Glorious as that is, salvation is not merely getting man out of hell and into heaven. It is getting God out of heaven and into man. It is the life of God within us. This is what the new birth is. 
Jesus said, he who hears these words of mine and believes him who sent me has eternal life, present tense, right now. It's not one day if I can just make it to heaven, close the door behind me, wipe the sweat off my brow and go, I made it. God, give me this life now. Now, the moment you're saved, the moment you enter through the narrow gate, that split second, quickly, in a moment, it is the life of God in the soul of a man. How good it is for your heart, your soul, your life to finally live as God intended. Jesus said, whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. And notice at the end of verse 14, and there are few who find it, few. This is out of the religious crowd. This is out of those who are saying, Lord, Lord. This is out of those who are prophesying supposedly, out of those who are casting out demons supposedly. There are very few who find it. One out of the four soils of those who sat under the Word of God responded. The disciples understood how small this gate was to enter in. They said in Luke 13, 23, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And in response, Jesus said, strive to enter through the narrow gate as if to affirm, you got it right. There are only a few. Not a one of us here will just grow up in it. Not a one of us here will just stumble through it. Not a one of us here will just happen upon it. You must search for the Lord with all of your heart. You must seek the Lord while He may be found and call upon Him while He is near. There are just a few. How can you know if you've entered through the narrow gate? Two ways. How can you know if you are headed for life? two ways. Number one, if you're on the narrow road, it's a certain indication that you went through the narrow gate because you can't get onto the narrow road except you enter through the narrow gate. The narrow gate is not just an outward morality. It is living a life for the glory of God with passion that you would supremely please Him, that you would long to keep His Word, that you would desire to pursue Christ and follow Christ, if that is the desire and the overriding thrust of your life, that is an indication you've come through the narrow gate. There's one other way, and I want to close with this, and then I'm finished. Come back to the beginning of this sermon not my sermon, Jesus' sermon. Come back to Matthew chapter 5. I want to show you Jesus' four spiritual law booklet. I want to show you the four steps that lead into the kingdom of heaven. I want to show you what will always accompany true saving faith and how easy it is, remember, to be deceived about your conversion, you need to know for sure that you've been saved. Beginning in Matthew 5 verse 3 and running through verse 7, there are four component parts that will always be found in true saving faith. You see, God is the author of saving faith. Hebrews 12 verse 2, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Philippians 1 verse 29 has been granted to us not only to suffer for, to, not only to suffer for His name, but to believe. It's been given to us. It is the gift of God. Now, what is found in true saving faith that enables you to go through the narrow gate? Look at these four component parts. Other things could be said. But in verse, thir- verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Listen, no one struts through the narrow gate. No one comes with arrogance. All who enter through the narrow gate have come to the place of recognizing their own spiritual poverty. 
You can't be saved until you know that you are poor in spirit poor on the inside. This word for poor means to be a beggar. It it pictured one who would be in a back corner, others would be going by, the person would be blind, the person would be a paralytic, they would have no way of providing their own living, they would be in a corner, they would be sticking out an empty hand, they would be unashamed to look up even into the eyes of those who who are passing by. They were totally dependent upon the mercy and the grace of another who would pass by to put into their empty hand that which they had not worked for, that which they would not deserve, that would come to them exclusively as an expression of the mercy and the compassion of the giver. That's the place you must come to in your life. Not like you're doing God some wild favor to show up in the kingdom, but for you to realize that God has shown you the mercy and the grace to declare personal bankruptcy, to say to God, God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Not just that I'm a sinner in general, but that, God, my life has violated Your holiness. And, God, I'm a sinner. I've been weighed in the balances, and I have been found wanting. Second, in true saving faith, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. You see, confession of sin is not enough. Everybody knows you're a sinner. You know you're a sinner. But there must be a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. There must be the inner turmoil of conviction of sin and brokenness on the inside and a smiting of the breast and a weeping not over for what your sin has done for you, but for how your sin has been an offense to a holy God and how your life has grieved the heart of God. No one gets into the kingdom without feeling the weight and the gravitas of their own sin that crushes their own soul. And then third, in verse 5, blessed are the gentle, blessed are the meek, some translations say, speaks of this time of a horse, a wild stallion, a horse where never a rider has sat. And to meek a horse is for a horse to be brought to the place where it will finally submit to a rider, where it will come under the authority of a master where the master will pull to the ropes to the right and the horse will go to the right, where the master now can pull back on the reins and the horse will stop, where the master can crack the whip and the horse will move out. That is what it is for a horse to be meeked, where you finally come under the sovereign authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and this is at the point of entrance into the kingdom. This is why Jesus said... Few there are who find it. And then finally, verse 7 or verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you see the progression? First you declare your own personal bankruptcy, then you weep and you mourn over your sin if there are not tears that are shed, but inwardly there is always this intercontrition of soul, and then you surrender and you come under the authority of Jesus Christ, and you surrender all to Him. And then in verse 6, you hunger and thirst for a righteousness that is not your own. Martin Luther called it an alien righteousness, meaning a righteousness outside of himself, a righteousness that he himself could not produce. It was a righteousness that was alien to him, that was strange to his own experience, that must be given to him. It is the very righteousness of God in Christ for which we must hunger and thirst and come and say, God, I hunger for Your salvation, I thirst for Your salvation, nothing else in this world will satisfy or fulfill, I must have the righteousness of Christ. 
It speaks of the cross ultimately, and Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. All of this speaks to the cross as Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, but it would ultimately take Him to a cross there where He would be lifted up to die, the virgin-born Son of God who lived a sinless and perfect life in the will of God. He was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. There on that cross, He was lifted up to die. He died in our place. God took our sins and transferred them to the Lord Jesus. He became our sin bearer upon that cross. He bore our sin and He suffered under the wrath of Almighty God as He bore the weight of our iniquity and the weight of our sin upon the cross. And He then said, having shed his blood and made the only atonement for our sin, he then said, it is finished. And the finality and the perfection of his sacrifice upon that cross as Jesus became the Savior of sinners. And you must come to him for your salvation. And if you come to him, you must come on his terms not your terms, and His terms are to enter through the narrow gate. You must strip down of all pride and arrogance. You must strip away all self-righteousness and come like a little child. And Him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Some of you here tonight have never been this close to this gate. Some of you here tonight, your toes are right up to this gate. And I want you to know this gate is wide open. This gate is ready to receive you. This gate, though it is a small gate tonight at this moment, you have found it. And you may enter in. You must exercise your will. You must choose to believe with a faith that only God can give you. God must remove your hard heart, and God must circumcise your heart, and God must give you a heart of flesh to believe upon Him, and when He does, you will enter through the narrow gate. I have to believe that there are here tonight, this moment, those who are just on the outside of the kingdom. And God has brought you here that the gate would be placed in front of you. And if you die without entering through this narrow gate, you will perish. And God will point you back to this night when you turned your back on the gate and you trampled underfoot the precious blood of Christ. But how glorious it is to enter through and to be saved. If you've never done so, I want you to know that the arms of Christ are extended to you tonight, and He is calling you through the preaching of the gospel. May you open your ears and hear His voice and respond. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for a gate, the gate, the only gate, for a way to get into Your kingdom. We understand because of what Adam did, we've all been cast out, and we've all been born on the outside and in and of ourselves unable to enter. And even in the church, just the church itself, no point of entrance, even religion, unable to provide access into the kingdom, rules and rituals, creeds and codes of conduct cannot allow us entrance into the kingdom. Father, we thank You for our Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. 
How we thank You that He left the glories of heaven to enter into the shame of this world and the sin of this world, that He might become one of us, that He would go to that cross and die in our place, that we might enter into the kingdom. We thank You, God, for the openness of this gate, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank You that this gate receives sinners. We thank You that this gate provides forgiveness and pardon for sin. We thank You that this gate puts us onto a new path with a new life direction, that this gate gives us eternal life, supernatural life. And, oh God, we thank You for the clarity of what You have said to us as written in Your Word, words spoken by the greatest evangelist who ever lived, the greatest preacher of the gospel the one who is Himself the gospel, Jesus Christ. I pray that here tonight there would be those who would enter through the narrow gate that leads to life. In Jesus' saving name we pray, amen.